And it is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thanks, Speaker. This morning, my first question once again goes to the Premier. Speaker, for months, Ontarians everywhere, businesses, health experts, everyday working folks, have been pushing for the government to answer basic questions about their COVID-19 response. Earlier this morning, uh, we called for a judicial inquiry, a full public judicial inquiry into the government's response to COVID-19. So will the government commit today to calling a full public judicial inquiry into its response to the COVID pandemic? Thank you. Apply for the government. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, uh, we were very quick uh, to ensure that there was a commission of inquiry into, uh, into long-term care, Mr. Speaker. But obviously, we are still in the midst uh, of, the, of the pandemic. And as I said yesterday, it, uh, uh, you know, I, look, I appreciate that the opposition uh, uh, wants to declare victory and say that it's over and move to reopening. And, uh, but, Mr. Speaker, our main priority right now obviously is going to continue to be the health and safety of the people of the province of Ontario. Look, with over seven and, uh, close to 7.5 million vaccines in people's arms, great progress, Mr. Speaker. Very, very good progress. Uh, I'm excited that the numbers seem to be going in the right direction, Mr. Speaker, but it's not time to declare victory. We're going to double down and make sure that all of the people of the province of Ontario are safe, Mr. Speaker, that when we get this behind us, the economy can come roaring back. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and there will be plenty of time for the members Response. of this legislature to investigate uh, the progress of the pandemic. Thank you. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, it is absolutely the right time for this government to commit to doing the right thing, as other governments have already done. This is something that needs to happen here in Ontario, just like it needs to happen in many, many other parts of this world. Look, this Ford government promised accountability. They promised answers, but their track record shows exactly the opposite of Order. that. They stonewalled their own long-term care commission and refused them uh, the extension that they had asked for uh, because they didn't want them to be able to do the job necessary. They promised an investigation into long-term care get deaths that were caused from neglect caused from dehydration that the Canadian Armed Forces discovered. They've ignored expert Question. advice and claimed that they didn't. So will the Premier commit today to holding a full public judicial inquiry into what happened with this government's response to COVID-19? And the government has well, Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As I just said, look, uh, the Auditor General has uh, taken a look. Uh, there's a commission of inquiry, Mr. Speaker, uh, as well. But I think there still needs to be, obviously, there will be plenty of time for, first and foremost, the members of this Legislative Assembly to look at, through its committees, to look at uh, how the pandemic of the before, during, and after, Mr. Speaker. Uh, having said that, I, I, I will reiterate, I'm just not on the same page with the, the Leader of the Opposition when it comes to declaring victory over, over this pandemic, Mr. Speaker. There is still a lot of work that remains to be done. Huge progress has been made. Yes, absolutely huge progress. Seven and a half million vaccines into people's arms. Thousands of appointments uh, uh, being booked, uh, Mr. Speaker. That is great news. But the job is not yet done. And for the members of the opposition to suggest uh, mission accomplished, Mr. Speaker, I just simply disagree. We're going to double down our efforts to make sure that uh, all Ontarians Response. are safe, Mr. Speaker, and that when we put this behind us once and for all, Mr. Speaker, we can put all that we need to to making sure that we unleash this economy like it was before the pandemic, Mr. Speaker. The final supplementary. Speaker, I fear we're now looking at yet another failure of this Ford government to do the right thing in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have watched Labor, as this government order. has made the wrong decisions. There are lessons to be learned here, and they need to be learned. This government needs to make a commitment to being very transparent and open in public about how this pandemic was uh, managed. 
There was a preventable third wave. They walked us right into it because they ignored expert advice, and 1,892 more people passed away in the third wave. The long-term care tragedy is unspeakable. 4,000 people lost their lives. The impacts are going to be felt for decades on families, on businesses, on jobs, on people's mental health. We need to learn what this government got wrong, including why the Liberals and the Conservatives failed to learn the lessons from the SARS pandemic. We okay. need to ensure that this never, ever happens again in Ontario. So will this government commit to an independent judicial inquiry? That's the very least that Ontarians deserve. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and, and of course, we have uh, had an auditor general's report. We've had a commission of inquiry into long-term care, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, that's right. The, the leader of the opposition party, of course, were against that commission of inquiry. Uh, but look, there, are, of course, are going to be lessons to be learned, Speaker. Of course, there are. Uh, and it is our responsibility to make sure that we learn from the mistakes of the previous four Liberal administrations that preceded this government, Mr. S Mr. Speaker. But we were moving very quickly, in fact, because we knew some of the problems that the previous Liberal government left us with, whether it was inadequate testing, whether it, w whether it was uh, the lowest ICU capacity uh, per capita in North America. We were moving very quickly on that. There are other lessons to be learned, too, Mr. Speaker, like why variants of concern have been allowed to come into this country through international borders, why the federal government hasn't worked with us after we've been pleading for months to close down our borders. Are there lessons to be learned? Absolutely. Spons? And the first place we can learn those lessons is through this, this legislature, through the members of this, uh, of this legislature, working through our committees to do so, Mr. Speaker. That's the first step. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, but uh, this minister is absolutely wrong in his assessment here. Uh, but this question is now to the Premier, and it re it's regarding the Minister of Health's statement yesterday that a reopening plan is coming soon. Uh, we know that this government has a dismal track record of ignoring experts all the way along. In fact, that's exactly uh, what led to the, uh, uh, the third wave being as bad as it was. Their reopening track record has, ca has caused us to be in the uh, third wave, has caused caused this pandemic uh, to be longer than necessary here in Ontario. It has cost lives, it has cost jobs, it has cost us businesses. So the question is, when will we actually see the plan? The Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much for the question. We have been very careful every step along the way, protecting the health and well-being of the people of Ontario. And emerging from this third wave, even though we're starting to see the numbers go down, we're not in the clear yet. We still have very high numbers in ICU. Today, they're down to 735, but that still is very high. We know that we have to take very careful steps because the last thing that we want in the province of Ontario is a fourth wave. So any steps that we may take in the future will be based on sound medical advice from Dr. Williams and for other health experts that are advising us because we know that we cannot move too quickly. The variants of concern are still out there. Things can raise up very quickly. So we need to take very, very careful steps to emerge from this third wave when the time is right. And a supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, that would be a really good change here in Ontario. That would be a really good change. This Premier and this Minister have claimed in the past that they've consulted with doctors, that they've listened to the experts. We've heard all of this before, but it doesn't ring true, Speaker. On November, in November of 2020, the government claimed that their colour-coded system was designed by expert advisors. That's what they claimed that the system was designed by the experts. But the reality shows something completely different. Those very advisors rejected the government plan we found out after. They had actually rejected the government plan. In February, the government ignored the science table advice while claiming that they were following it. In fact, the Premier said, and I quote, we've always listened to the chief medical officer and the health team. And the experts say that decision not to listen is is exactly what brought us to the devastating third wave that we are still Question. dealing with, Speaker. So why would anybody believe the Premier and the Minister of Health now? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Notwithstanding the comments made by the leader of the official opposition, our government 
has in the past and always will continue to rely on the advice of Dr. Williams and the other medical experts who are providing us with advice and recommendations. They are reviewing the science, data and trends along with collaborating with local medical officers of health and the, are looking at the indicators such as the epidemiology of the virus, the number of cases, the percentage positivity, the health system capacity, ICU occupancy and general hospitalizations, public health system capacity, and of course, the rate of vaccinations, which I'm very proud to say are now at over 7.4 million vaccines having been distributed. 57% of the population of Ontario over age 18 has now received at least a first dose. Final supplementary. Everyone knows that this Premier, this government walked us right into the third wave because at every step, while he was insisting that the expert advice was being followed, those same experts were actually begging the government to change course. As a result, we now have 732 patients in the ICU today, and in fact, today we've hit a horrifying milestone where now over 2,000 more Ontarians lost their lives to COVID-19 in the third wave. Those are parents. Those are children. Those are children who have been left orphaned, mothers, fathers, wives, husbands. We need to get this right. We absolutely can't trust the Ford government, unfortunately, to do that. So the question is, will this government commit today to a reopening plan that is, plan that is actually question. backed by science and that, and that we can see for ourselves where it's come from so that people can actually trust the reopening plan? Because they certainly can't trust Mr. F uh, we certainly can't trust this government and this premier to get it right. Perfect. And to reply, the minister. Thank you, Speaker. Yes. Thank you. The next question, member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Timmins declared a state of emergency on Monday in response to the recent rapid surge of COVID-19 cases, the bulk of them within Timmins itself. The Porcupine Health Unit has called upon the government to recognize Timmins as a provincial hotspot to ensure that vaccines and supplies are readily available for the community. They also need support to enhance capacity for testing and to set up a community isolation centre. We are now seeing young, healthy individuals requiring hospitalization. This is really, really concerning for Northern Ontario. Will the government provide the support Timmins needs to respond to this surge of cases. And to reply, the Minister of Health. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Yes, of course, we will provide support in any situation where there is a, a hotspot emerging, where ad additional resources are needed. We are watching this situation very carefully, and we will provide the supports that are needed to enable the situation to be brought back under control. But with respect to vaccinations, I can advise that we are receiving over 2 million vaccination doses this week, that we are going to be able to supply all of the public health unit regions, all 34 around Ontario, with significant volumes of, of vaccines so that people can be protected, young people and, uh, and seniors as well, and everyone in between. A supplementary question, the member for Kiwetanaw. Uh, speaker, uh, back to the Premier. Uh, we have to know that uh, the geography of the North and limited resources make our health care uh, uh, system vulnerable, uh, especially in emergencies. Remote and uh, sparsely populated communities are far from uh, health care. People in regions uh, across the north have driven over hundreds of kilometers to get to their vaccines uh, because it's not, all, it's not getting to all northern communities equally. Our public health units are doing this their best uh, with limited resources, Mr. Speaker. Uh, now, Tim Mintz is in a uh, third highest number of active COVID cases per capita in Ontario. They need resources, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, will you commit to getting those resources to uh, Timmins, uh, what, uh, what they need, so their health care is not overwhelmed? Yes or no? Mr. Health. 
Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Yes, of course, we will assist Timmins if they ha require additional resources in addition to vaccines, if they need more support to, uh, to deal with any outbreak. And we want to make sure that we can supply everyone who wants a vaccine with one. Uh, I would just also refer to um, Operation Remote Immunity, which was a big success in uh, vaccinating our First Nations people on 31 fly-in communities, as well as in Moosonee. We want to get back to do the second doses as well, as well as to deal with young people ages 12 to 17, who can now be vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine. We are committed to that, and we are going to be ramping up Operation Remote Immunity to go back again to finish the job. So thank you very much. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Yeah, thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you. Speaker, I, I continue to talk to frustrated Willowdalers every day who, who have made incredible sacrifices over the past year, but they're also very worried. And they're worried uh, be, because of these variants of concerns entering Ontario. And we know for a fact that these variants did not originate inside of Ontario's borders, uh, Speaker. We also know. Uh, the, for a fact that, that the majority of cases today of COVID-19 remain those variants of concerns. And so my, my constituents have a right to be worried, uh, Speaker. And we've, if we look to the example around the world of other jurisdictions and see what they've done, our, our nation cousins have, have implemented stricter border policies to stop the entry of COVID-19, and, and they've had great success. Uh, Speaker, I did read recently, however, that the, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom has come under fire for not restricting travel from international hotspots sooner. So, Speaker, my question, question is to the Solicitor General. Can she share lessons from the UK experience that, that would be relevant to stopping the spread uh, here in Ontario? The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the member from Willowdale for continuing to raise this important issue because it's not going away and we actually need to deal with it with our federal cousins. The spread of variants of concerns is not just something Ontario is monitoring and raising the alarms about. As the member mentioned in the United Kingdom, as an example, you cannot enter if you have been in or through any country on their red list 10 days prior. The British Prime Minister has indeed been under fire for not adding some countries to this list sooner. This delay, some have claimed, have caused unnecessary spread of the new variants of concern just as the UK was reopening. In Canada, we don't even have red list. We have a couple of blocked countries, but as we know, it takes only two mouse clicks to reroute your flight with a layover in another country to flaunt the rule. In fact, travel sites do it for you. It's time for our country's Prime Minister to step up with stricter measures at Bonds. our borders as well. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the, the Solicitor General, because that's exactly what I'm hearing uh, from my constituents, is that frustration after putting in a year of sacrifice and, and, and affecting their lives in every way imaginable. You would think that uh, our partners in Ottawa would have put in some safeguards to protect our borders by this point, this far into the pandemic, this far into the third wave, uh, but they have not. And Speaker, it's not just international travel. I mean, McLean's uh, article from last week said this virus just isn't flying into Canada. It's also on a crisscrossing tear inside of our borders, uh, Speaker. And, and I think that most Ontarians would agree with that, that more should have been done by our Prime Minister. So back to the Minister. Can the Solicitor General tell us more about the countries on the restricted list for the UK? Solicitor General. Absolutely. Thank you. The UK actually has 40 countries on their red list. Canada has no countries that stop you from traveling to Canada. We only limit direct flights. The federal government does restrict direct flights from India and Pakistan, but there are no rules against rerouting through other countries. The UK, Australia, and New Zealand restrict travel based on where you've been, not what flight you take. As other countries talk of tightening up travel restrictions, Canada is actually mulling over lifting restrictions along our longest border. Ontario is taking all necessary steps to stop the variants. It's time for our federal government to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, PCAB reviewed the twice-delayed application by Charles McVitie's Canada Christian College. Conservatives have bent over backwards to help Charles McVitie. This fall, in an omnibus bill, they buried legislation allowing him to turn his college into a university that offers arts and science credits. PCAB made a decision last night, and while we wait for the minister's response, here's what we know. We know Charles McVitie never shied away from using his college platform to attack LGBTQ2S communities. 
and he never shied away from using his college platform to attack Muslim Ontarians. And so through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Premier, when will this government tell Ontarians that people who, who spew hate should never run universities? To reply, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question from the member opposite. Uh, Speaker, as we've said uh, from day one, this government understands and respects the independent PCAB process. Speaker, it's because of that independent process and because of the educational experts embedded in that process that Algoma University is expanding its educational opportunities in the North for learners in the North. It's because of that independent process that OCAD University in downtown Toronto is expanding opportunities for students in the arts, embracing new challenges, embracing new learning techniques, Speaker. It's because of that independent process that we've seen Seneca pivot to offer programming for in-demand labour market needs, Speaker, and it's because of that independent process, regardless of who applies, that we've ensured a high quality of education in this province. Speaker, we will always, as we said from day one, Response. respect the independent educational advice from the PCAP committee. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. The McVitie's quest to own a university should never have gotten this far. It never should have come to this. The Premier and this whole government encouraged Charles McVitie at every step. They emboldened him enough to think he can build a bigger platform for his hateful rhetoric. As long as Charles McVitie supported the Premier, the Premier had his back. And in the meantime, the Minister of Colleges and Universities refuses to invest in Laurentian. He won't speak out against McVitie's hate. He's leaving post-secondary institutions to fend for themselves during a pandemic. So, Mr. Speaker, through you to the Premier, why won't the government reverse the legislation and stop wasting precious time and resources on people like his bigoted friend, Charles McVitie? And to reply, the member for Northumberland, Peter Burrows. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, it's this government that's historically lowered tuition for learners in this province. It's this government that's expanded mental health supports, that stood with our universities and our publicly assisted colleges through the difficulty of this pandemic, providing additional funds to support learners. Again, um, Mr. Speaker, it's because of independent processes independent of political influence, independent processes that have a rigorous review on student freedoms in the PCAB process, a rigorous review on organi organizational structure, a rigorous review on student supports, led not by politicians, but by educational experts. I find it ironic that all of a sudden now the members interested in the PCAB process it's that member that wanted politicians to make those decisions. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, as difficult as it is, we will always stand by Order. the independent educational advice of the PCAP Response. process, Mr. Speaker. We will respect it, and I would encourage the members opposite to do the same. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Um, as I have worked to draft my private member's bill that will be debated later on today, I have been hearing from many leaders in my riding and from across the province that have been working tirelessly to fight racism. As elected representative, it is our responsibility to work towards a truly inclusive province. To this day, there are children in our classrooms who cannot reach their full potential because of systemic barriers obstructing their success. Your ministry, Mr. Minister of Education, has an ed Equity Education Secretariat Initiatives branch, but I haven't seen any initiatives lately, even given the important rise of racism incidents over the last year and more. Can the minister provide some information regarding any recent initiatives to address equity is issues in our schools? To respond, the Minister of Education. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, obviously, you know we both have a, a shared interest in um, in breaking down the systemic barriers that really impede the success of young people in the province. It's why this government uh, made a pretty significant, bold step in destreaming the new uh, Grade Nine math curriculum, which will be unveiled shortly for the benefit of all children in this province, lifting up the performance of students in Ontario. It's why we have initiated just last week a over $300,000 investment to counter anti-Asian racism that is very much on the rise in this province and around the world. Uh, it's also, Speaker, why we took action to end discretionary suspensions of young children disproportionately impacting racialized and black and indigenous children. It's why we've mandated all 
uh, trustees and senior board staff to undergo a human rights training to build that capacity and that culture within our schools of inclusivity and respect, something that I think the member opposite and I share. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the Minister of Education. The fight against racism obviously needs to be led on multiple fronts, but one of those has to be education. As the work towards a brighter future for our children, we must recognize that giving them tools now to understand equity issues and to participate to the development of an inclusive and equitable Ontario is something that we wish for our children. So as I am a firm believer that schools are the starting point to a better society, I ask, does the minister support action to modernize our curriculum and make schools places where our children can learn and contribute to building a more inclusive and equitable province. Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. We certainly agree that this is a priority. It's why we tackled actions to um, to really uh, reduce those barriers well before the pandemic and during the pandemic, Speaker. We have urged school boards and accelerated the collection of race-based data and the account and the public release of it to create accountability. We think we have to me you have to understand the problem by measuring it first. It's also why we've ensured that there's anti-racism, anti-discrimination training in all curriculum mandatory from kindergarten all the way up to grade 12. And Speaker, one of the, um, I think, most compelling case studies of supporting racialized children is making sure that they can see themselves reflect in their educators, which is why we abolished Regulation 274 to ensure equity, diversity, and yes, merit leads the way in the hiring of new educators in Ontario. Thank you. And the next question, the member for Willowdale. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And I'm still going to talk about Willowdale, and it has to do with transit this time, and an election promise our government made to, to get Ontarians moving, specifically in the Greater Toronto Area, where transit has not kept pace with growth. And nowhere is that pain felt more than in Willowdale, which hit its provincial growth targets uh, for 2041. It did that a few years ago, Speaker. And so it's, 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 it's finally time to get these subways built. And I, I'm, I'm so happy that Willowdalers got some excellent news last week uh, with an announcement that the federal government has committed to funding 40 percent of the Premier's historic $28.5 billion transit expansion plan. So, Speaker, this is really exciting for Willowdales, but they need more details. So, can the Associate Minister of Transportation tell us how these transit projects will achieve the promise of addressing the growth in Willowdale? The Associate Minister of Transportation with responsibility for the GTA. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I think you can tell that I can't stop smiling when, uh, uh, when the member speaks about the subject. But, Mr. Speaker, a tremendous amount of work has been undertaken to advance the single largest build of public transportation in Ontario's history. I want to thank the Premier for his vision and Minister Mulroney for working so hard to negotiate a great deal for Ontario. It wasn't always easy, Mr. Speaker, but she successfully persisted. The funding commitment confirms the continued construction of our Ontario line, our Young North extension, our three-stop Scarborough subway, and our predominantly tunneled Eglinton Crosstown West extension. These transit lines will reduce gridlock, which is desperately needed in the GTA and especially right here in Toronto, so that people can get to where they need to go and so that goods can move across the province very, very quickly. Mr. Speaker, this not only means we will be improving the quality of life for people here in the GTA, but we will be injecting the GTA with billions of dollars to, to our local economy here. Thank you. And the supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And really is excellent news for Willowdalers. I mean, Willowdalers are very familiar with uh, gridlock, the challenges associated with that, the, the challenges associated with uh, overcrowding on the subways. And so my constituents have been waiting for this news for a long time. And, and Speaker, uh, we're, we're almost there. I mean, I've had relatives visit from overseas, look at our subway map, and this is decades ago, laugh at it. Uh, for a city our size, we do not have enough subway service. That's a fact. So I'm looking forward to the day where we have a spider web network of subways, and this is an important step towards that. So my, spe my question is going to be back to the Associate Minister. Now that this landmark uh, expansion plan has funding uh, attached to it from the federal government of $10.7 billion, can the Minister tell us how we're going to plan and develop it differently so that these projects will benefit generations to come? The member for York Centre will come to order. The Associate Minister of Transportation. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course I can. Our plans are centered around building fast, reliable transit, but Mr. Speaker, we also have a focus on building complete communities. Throughout this pandemic, Mr. Speaker, we have spent the last 14 months confined to our immediate neighborhoods. Having gone through this experience together, we have learned a lot. We have learned about the importance of walkable communities so that people everywhere you, so that you can access everything that you need within a 15 to a 20 minute walk, whether it's a grocery store or a pharmacy, Mr. Speaker, and also so that you can have easier access to employment centers across the city so that you can travel to take care of your Order. loved ones. Mr. Speaker, this moment in time has pre presented us with a great opportunity, and Mr. Speaker, we will not waste it. We are going to build transit Spons? and we are going to build complete communities. Yeah. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, the City of Toronto's annual employment survey was released this week, and the findings shine a light on the absolute devastation our largest city has suffered due to the painful and repeated lockdowns made longer by this government's failures. The survey recorded a 7.6 per cent decline in total jobs, making it the largest single-year decline since the survey was initiated in 1983. By the end of 2020, a staggering 3,480 businesses had been closed. Speaker, the people of Toronto want to know, why did the Premier repeatedly ignore the pleas for help from small businesses who were being forced into evictions, gouged by insurance companies? and left without the means to replace lost revenue. And to reply, the member for Willowdale and Parliamentary Assistant, the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Speaker, and certainly we recognize that uh, small businesses in this province have been impacted greatly uh, by COVID-19, and, and these are our job creators. These are, the, these are where these jobs come from, Speaker, and that's why this government from the get-go, uh, from when COVID-19 began, has introduced a series of measures from the beginning, most recently in a grant program that the member opposite has voted against, Speaker. The member has done no favors to these small businesses by voting against every support measure, whether that was hydro reductions, tax reductions, not just to get through this pandemic, but for, to position these businesses for success in the future. So, so the question to the member is, what has the member voted in favor of to support these job creators? Name one measure that the member has voted in favor of supporting small businesses. Supplementary question. Speaker, let me tell you, the words of the member opposite are cold comfort to the small business owners who have lost everything Order. this year and to the nearly 120,000 workers who do not have a job to return to. Those businesses are not coming back. In Davenport, we've lost cherished local businesses like Wallflower on Dundas West, Starving Artist on St. Clair, and Queen West's iconic LGBTQ bar, The Beaver. There's a tide of for lease signs like no one has ever seen before all across this city, and those that have survived up to now are begging you to stop forcing them, jumping through hoops to get a small business grant that barely covers their needs. Speaker, Toronto's economic recovery is absolutely essential to Ontario's economic recovery. Will the Premier Question. finally wake up to that fact and fix this mess? Member for Willowdale. So, Speaker, what I hear is that uh, the member has not voted in favour of any of the support measures this government has introduced, not one, but I will remind the Legislature and the businesses in Toronto uh, also that the opposition did not put forward a single amendment through the budgetary process, the official channel through which to suggest further measures to support these small businesses, not, not one. one. Speaker, so now as we move through, and thanks to the efforts of our health minister, nearly half the population in Ontario has been vaccinated with their first dose. That means hope is indeed on the horizon, and we see those brighter days. And this government has positioned these businesses for success tomorrow as well, because it's not just about COVID-19. The, now the members voted against that as well, Speaker. But here's the thing for the small businesses. We're going to get through this, and despite the efforts of the opposition, we're going to position you for success. We're busy fighting this virus. We're busy fighting for small businesses. The opposition Order. is simply too busy fighting this government. The next question, the member of order, order. The next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, May is Cystic Fibrosis Awareness Month. Now, Ontarians living with cystic fibrosis have waited too long for life-changing drugs that could transform their lives. They're available in other countries around the world, but, but not here. 
Trikapta is a transformational drug that can treat up to 90 per cent of Canadians with CF. The federal government is poised to end the review and provide recommendations by the end of June. In England, the National Health Service finalized negotiations with the manufacturer and agreed to fund the drug before regulatory approval. Ontario can do the same, Mr. Speaker. Will the government negotiate with Vertex immediately so that once approved, this drug can be prescribed to desperate CF patients as soon as possible? To reply, Minister of Health. Speaker, and thank you to the member very much for the question. This is an important issue, I know, to many Ontarians. And Trikafta has shown great promise as an effective treatment for cystic fibrosis patients, and this is an important step for CF patients to be able to access new drug therapies such as Trikafta in Canada. Uh, our public drug programs look forward to continuing their discussions with Vertex as Trikafta moves through the steps in the drug review process, which includes, of course, approval by Health Canada for sale in Canada, a review of the clinical and cost information through a health technology assessment, and finally, reaching successful pricing negotiations with the PCPA, the Canadian Pharmaceutical, Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance. So the, it is working its way through the system. We are doing whatever we can to follow up and to work with Vertex so that these products can be Response. available to cystic fibrosis patients in Ontario. And the supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplemental is for the Minister uh, of Health. 12-year-old uh, Camille Rochon from Orleans is one of the many cystic fibrosis patients in Ontario whose life depends on timely access to Trikafta. Now, it appears, based on that answer, that Trikafta will be delayed by the same health care red tape that has delayed so many other groundbreaking treatments uh, here in Ontario that are available in other parts of the world. Every day that passes without access to these medications means more sickness, more hospital visits, and even more death. Mr. Speaker, the Premier, his minister, and this government has the power to get Ontarians with CF affordable access to Trikafta. He could help, and the minister could help, the vast majority of CF patients have a brighter future. I know that the minister wants to say yes, so just say yes. Will you ensure that Trikafta is available at an affordable price here in Ontario the moment it receives federal regulatory approval. Health. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you again for the question. Of course, we want all of these uh, new drugs to be able to be approved and to be able to be available for people. And I know that many people in Mr. the, the environment come to order cystic fibrosis community are looking forward to having this approved, but uh, you will also know that there has to be a process to make sure that we take an evidence-based approach to the approval of these new medications by funding decisions that considers the clinical effectiveness, effectiveness of the drug, the safety, patient input, affordability, and effects on other health services. So, of course, I am as anxious as anyone else is to have these uh, drugs approved because we want to be able to help people with cystic fibrosis lead um, more normal lives. I know that life is very difficult for them, and I am uh, speaking with my uh, ADM in this area on a regular basis to understand where the system is, and anything that we can do in the Ministry of Health to move things forward, we certainly will do. Yeah. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I, I know our government's been making uh, long overdue investments into our health care system. These are investments that the previous Liberal government simply failed uh, to make. And, and these is Stop the call. The Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks will come to order. Minister, the member for Ottawa South will come to order. Please restart the clock. Member for Willowdale. Uh, thank you, Speaker. These investments into our health care system also include, of course, the education of our future generation of nursing students in Ontario. And we've all heard uh, the many stories of Ontarians who wanted to become nurses but were unable to find a program close to home or weren't able to get into a program, even though they were qualified uh, because of a lack of increased uh, enrollment opportunities. Speaker, I'm proud that our government has taken the right steps to ensure that this changes, that prospective nursing students have more choices uh, and improved access to excellent post-secondary training. Uh, so you, through you, Speaker, can the Minister of, of Colleges and Universities uh, tell us more details about what the government is doing to support the training of more nurses? Member from Northumberland, Peterborough South, and Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you. 
Speaker, and, and it's always very exciting to rise in the House to talk about outside-the-box thinking and about leadership that this government is taking to invest in increased nursing spots for our next generation of nurses across our great province. And Speaker, that member's right. This government made a historic $35 million investment to expand nursing spots in this province. Speaker, it was the first expansion in nursing seats in over 20 years, Speaker. 20 years! The first expansion in nursing seats. But what does that mean, Speaker? For fall 2021, that means in our 2021-2022 cohort, over 2,000 additional students, of which 1,130 will be practical nurses and over 807, 870 RNs. Speaker, we reach that number in close consultation with the sector, reaching out proactively, seeking feedback Response. from our partners in the post-secondary sector, asking them how many additional seats they can do. And, Speaker, it supports historic investments from this Minister of Health to end hallway health care and deliver be better patient-centered care. Thank you. And the supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and I really appreciated that answer because, uh, you know, in Willowdale, uh, nurses and students appreciate being close to home, being able to study and work close to home. Uh, so we look forward to, to continuing to care for our communities in the right way that my constituents want to see, Speaker. And this, this takes those investments. But um, I know that we've also committed to establishing a nation-leading uh, four-point, or sorry, four hours of care per resident in long-term care homes. This is going to take a lot of PSWs as well, um, and we've made significant investments there uh, by supporting and training up to 16,000 at our private career colleges, publicly assisted colleges, and school boards, uh, tuition-free. Uh, now, Speaker, I will say I was, I was shocked uh, to see the NDP critic for the co colleges and university voice her opposition to the initiative to train 8,000 PSWs at our private career colleges. I was also shocked to see that member vote against the $4.9 billion to establish that four hours no. of daily care per resident. Um, so, Speaker, through you to the minister, back Question. to the minister. Um, what is the minister's or what parliamentary assistance reaction to the NDP's opposition to training more PSWs? Member for Northumberland, Peter Brosa. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, you know, Speaker, when, when we sit down with partners in the sector, uh, a commitment we make is to serve everybody in the sector and to work with all partners and leave no stone unturned. And so it was deeply, deeply uh, disappointing uh, to see the comments from that member opposite who would, who would turn her back on our partners that train over 75% of PSWs in this province. Eight thousand PSWs that this government wants to bring into the system that are so desperately needed to care for our loved ones. And that, what that member might be interested in learning is that of the 75 percent PSW graduates, 65 percent are women and 50 percent are from racialized and marginalized communities. So on this side of the House, Speaker, we're going to work with every partner in the post-secondary sector, not Response. driven by ideology, but driven by the need to work and leave no stone unturned to ensure that we deliver better patient-centered care in the province of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Next question, the member for Hamilton West and Cass to the Premier, uh, Mr. Speaker, we all know this has been a very difficult year for our kids. They are pleading to let us play. Unfortunately, the PC government just voted down our motion to safely reopen outdoor recreational facilities to boost mental health. The Premier received a letter from Athletics Ontario urging the government to follow the advice of his own health experts and immediately reopen outdoor sports activities. They write, we cannot overstate the mental health crisis facing our children and youth. An Ontario soccer survey found that without youth soccer, 40% of respondents reported feeling anxiety, stress and worry. So how is this government responding? The Premier teased that summer camps will be open, but then he disappeared. No plan. On Monday, the Minister of Health said, today is not the day to reopen outdoor sports. On Tuesday, she said, today is not the day. Today is Wednesday. Kids and parents are feeling enough anxiety. They don't need to be held in suspense. When Question. can we expect this government to start listening to them? To apply the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, in fact, we do encourage people to be outdoors. We do encourage them to go out and enjoy this wonderful weather that we're experiencing. This is uh, something important for everyone to do, not just, not just children, but for everyone. It improves everyone's mental health to be outside, to go for a walk, go for a run, go for a bike ride, do whatever you want to do. The parks are open. We encourage people to use them. Please go out and enjoy this great weather. That's going to improve everyone's mood, mental health, and physical health as well by getting out to uh, get some physical activity. Back to our Premier, 
Tragically, the devastating impact of socialization on children's mental health is a full-blown crisis. This government's repeated failure to follow expert health advice has created problems for our kids that will not go away with the end of the pandemic. In a CBC survey, 92 per cent of Hamilton teachers said that the challenges of this year will have psychological impacts on their students. The team at McMaster's Children's Hospital are raising the alarm. They report that the number of youth being admitted after a suicide attempt has tripled this year. We have seen the devastating consequence of a government that never seems to have a plan. Mr. Speaker, our kids are not okay. They don't need more empty words. We need a whole-of-government response. How many kids in crisis is too many before this government will act? Minister of Health. Speaker. Well, just before the pandemic struck us the last year, we had just released a Roadmap to Wellness, our comprehensive mental health and addictions plan for the province of Ontario, which would provide a continuum of care across the system for people of all ages. We have invested $175 million extra on that plan as part of our plan to build over $3.8 billion over 10 years more into our mental health and addictions plan. We've also put $176 million into the uh, mental health and addiction system this year and an additional $147 million to immediately expand access to the provincial mental health and addiction system for individuals and families in order to address the issues that many Ontarians are facing during the course of this pandemic. We will continue to do more because we recognize that this pandemic has had significant significant uh, effects Response? on many people, and we are prepared to deal with that. We know these issues are going to continue long after the pandemic, and we are building up the resources in order to be able to help people through this. The next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Health. Last Tuesday, I suggested to the minister that it's astounding that almost all be beds saved by cancelling surgeries are sitting empty. Surgeries of real patients are cancelled to save beds for computer-modeled COVID patients. The minister responded that the hospitals are in fact full, so I went back that afternoon to look at capacity on the day before May 10. In Toronto, the hotspot ICU occupancy was 81% with a goal of being under 90%. Acute beds occupancy was at 84% with a goal of being under 90%. 2,033 of our province's ICU beds were occupied. That's 84% ICU occupancy. In Burlington, 252 beds were occupied out of 335 beds. That's 75%. In Ottawa, ICU capacity on May 10th was 66%. I can go on and on. My question to the Minister of Health. She said the beds are not taking up by the computer models and are not taking up to preserve capacity. She said the beds were full. Speaker, why did she say our beds were full when the beds were not full and in some cases below the stand for stated occupancy goal? To reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, as once again, I can advise the member opposite that the beds are full, that they are full. We're still requiring patient transfers from one hospital to another in order to balance that load. We still have 735 people in our intensive care units. We are still dealing with the effects of this pandemic. However, I would also wish to advise that uh, Directive No. 2, which restricted non-emergency surgeries, uh, has been amended to allow hospitals, as long as they fall within the guidelines set out by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, to continue doing, start doing day surgeries to start working on that surgical backlog. This is good news for the people of Ontario, and I know that there are many hospitals that are going to be anxious to start with these surgical uh, procedures and surgeries as well. And the supplementary. Thank you for that. In fact, last Tuesday I asked the minister, why did we cancel surgeries of ambulatory patients? It made completely no sense. They don't need a bed, so thank you for restarting those. Speaker, if the beds are full, then maybe the minister can tell us what are the occupancy numbers. She is the minister of health. She can tell us what is the occupancy in Toronto today? What is it historically? What's the CCSO for Ontario today? What is it historically? If I'm wrong or misleading this house, I stand to be corrected. But, Speaker, there's in fact a segment of beds that is full. It's youth mental health beds. Yesterday, the CBC reported that CHIO is overwhelmed by the increase in the number of young people needing mental health care, and CHEO is looking to send teenage patients to adult hospitals. CHEO says they never had to do anything like this before, and that 50 percent of all patients visiting ER now are seeking mental care, so it appears some beds are full. They're full with kids and teenagers suffering from mental health pandemic created by this government. Will the minister acknowledge the catastrophe caused by her lockdown Question. policies on the mental health of kids and teenagers? 
Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, certainly we know that there has been an effect on the uh, mental health of everyone in Ontario as a result of this pandemic. But we've needed to take the steps that we've had to take with respect to the lockdown to save people's lives. That's why we're doing it, to save people's lives. We recognize the mental health effects. We are dealing with that. We're putting another $175 million into the system this year. We know that we've already put an additional $147 million in to deal with these issues. They will continue post-pandemic. We are prepared to put whatever resources we need to into that to deal with these things. But there's no question that this lockdown was necessary in order to stop the spread and save people's yeah. lives. Okay, the next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, on Monday, health units learned with one day's notice that COVID-19 vaccine eligibility was opening up to everyone 18 years of age and over. Not surprisingly, yesterday in London, demand far outstripped supply, with thousands of Londoners jamming the phone lines and the website to vie for limited appointments. Middle <laughs> Middlesex London's Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Chris Mackey, said in no, no uncertain terms that our health unit has nowhere near enough vaccines for all the people in the new group. Speaker, did this government do any consultation at all with local health units so they would be prepared for this sudden change in eligibility? Order. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Yes, in fact, we are in regular contact with the medical officers of health across this province. We have conversations with them, Minister Jones and I, uh, two or three times per week. So they were very well aware of this change well in advance of when it was coming. They were also well aware of the numbers of vaccines coming into their area. We can only make appointments for the vaccines that we have, and this is going to be subject to supply on an ongoing basis. We know that we have a, a large number of supplies that are coming in during the month of May and, and into June. We don't have the figures post that, but we can only book for where we have vaccines. And I think the fact that we had over 277,000 people call in just yesterday when the, ex the criteria expanded to age 18 indicates that people are anxious to receive this, their vaccines. And we're very grateful to the people of Ontario Response. for taking these up. Supplementary. Speaker, the Middlesex London Health Unit is ready to add appointments as soon as vaccines are available. Limited supply in mass clinics and in pharmacies has meant that London's vaccination rate is trailing the provinces. Despite Dr. Mackey's efforts to secure a reasonable supply of doses to vaccinate Londoners aged 18 plus, he tweeted on Monday night, a last-ditch effort this afternoon has failed to procure additional vaccine supplies for tomorrow's opening to adults 18 to 39. This means we have 24,000 appointments for about 135,000 people. I'm sorry in advance for the frustrating situation of limited vaccine supply. Speaker, London was overlooked in the initial pharmacy vaccination program and currently has no pharmacies administering vaccines. Why is this government continue to deny Londoners our proportionate share of doses. Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, first of all, uh, Dr. Mackey is doing a wonderful job in London with uh, the rollout of the vaccines. He's an important member of, of the, the team of the 34 local public health uh, unit leaders that are rolling them out. But London is receiving its proportionate share of vaccines. We've reverted back to 100% distribution among the 34 public health units based on population and based on risk. And we will be supplying those vaccines to Dr. Mackey and to his team as soon as we we receive them. They have a significant allocation because of the 2.2 million doses that we're receiving this week, and we will continue to make sure that London receives the vaccines it needs to make sure that the population can be vaccinated. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier, the federal government's Public Health Agency of Canada has stated that their desire is to see Canadians go back to outdoor activities, but only after 75% of those eligible for vaccines have received at least one dose, something Ontarians were permitted to do last summer before vaccines were offered. The federal government's public health officer, Theresa Tam, has said indoor sports, family gatherings, and attending college university should resume only after 75% of those eligible are fully vaccinated. In Ontario, less than 3% have been fully vaccinated. 
And Justin Trudeau has said the U.S. border will only open after 75 per cent are fully vaccinated. Is this Ontario government basing its social restriction rules on the federal government's recommendations that 75 per cent of the population being vaccinated before Ontario's draconian restrictions are lifted? Or does it have its own figure that it's working towards that it can reveal to the people of Ontario? And to respond, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, of course, we listen to the recommendation, recommendations of Health Canada, to the recommendations of NACI. We also listen to the recommendations of the medical advisors advising our Chief Medical Officer of Health on when this would be a, a safe plan, safe time to exit the lockdown strategy. There will be more information available very soon with respect to this, but we need to factor in a number of issues, not just the number of vaccines administered, the level of hospitalizations, ICU capacity, the R levels. There are a number of factors that need to be considered, and they come from a variety of sources. Supplementary. Speaker. In the United Kingdom, society has reopened with 30 per cent of the population being fully vaccinated. South of the Canadian border, where 37 per cent of the population has been fully vaccinated, things have reopened. Yet, in Ontario, we don't have a roadmap or a goal from this government as to when people can expect things to get back to normal. Is it 30 per cent full vaccination, 37 per cent full vaccination, or is it what the federal Liberal Trudeau government wants, 75 per cent? What figure is the Ontario government working off of? And if it is the 75% figure, what is the scientific reason for the figure being more than double other jurisdictions like the United Kingdom? Minister of Health. Thank you very much. Well, we are developing an Ontario guideline that is, will allow us to safely uh, exit the lockdown when the time is right, because the last thing we want is a fourth wave. We have to avoid that at all costs. It would be devastating for the people of Ontario and for the businesses of Ontario. So we know that we need to proceed very, very cautiously, and that is what we will do. But it will be based on the medical evidence, the clinical data, and the recommendations of Dr. Williams and the other medical experts that are advising us. The next question, the member for Spadina, Port York. So, my question is to the Premier. The City of Toronto announced last week that the CNE would be cancelled for the second year in a row, and this is only the third time in its 142-year history that the CNE has been cancelled. The other time was in, during World War II. So, with a second year of revenue loss, the C City has said that the provincial government support is needed, or the CNE may be closed forever. So, we all know how important the CNE is. We know, like for me, my parents took me, I took my kids, my grandparents took my parents, and this is a story that's repeated again and again across this province. We all, it's a 142 year history. It's an iconic event in, in the province of Ontario. Right. So my question to the government is, will the government commit to providing the financial support to make sure the CNE restarts in 2022, or will the government add to its legacy the permanent loss of the CNE. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know that uh, uh, the Minister, Minister McLeod, has been working uh, very closely uh, uh, with all uh, all uh, representatives uh, in that sector, Mr. Speaker. It's not just the CNE, of course. Uh, it's uh, si it's been a significantly difficult time for uh, many of the people in our, our tourism and hospitality uh, sector. Uh, uh, this is a sector that is, as the member uh, has, has highlighted, I think, uh, that is so important uh, to uh, not only to the City of Toronto, but when it comes to jobs and economic uh, activity, this is an incredibly important sector hundreds of thousands of jobs, billions of dollars worth of activity, Mr. Speaker. That is why the Minister of Finance brought in a, a program to, to support uh, uh, some of the industries uh, within that sector, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, there's more work to be done uh, on that. Uh, uh, there were a lot of lessons learned, in particular in Toronto, coming out of SARS, of how long it took that sector to, uh, to recover. Uh, the Minister, Minister McLeod, understands this, and she's already working closely with that sector, because Response? without the revival of the hospitality sector, uh, uh, the arts and culture sector in the province, of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, this economy will not roar back. It is too important to us, and we will make sure that there is support there for them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm glad to hear the government member recognizes the importance of the event and tourism industry to Ontario's economy and to our culture. Uh, but they've also said a lot of important words or words about the importance of small businesses. But 
They've let 20, 25,000 small businesses go bankrupt in 2020 before they finally introduced the Small Business Support Grant. The supply to the CNE is just one example of the major events in my riding of Spadina, Fort York, whose futures are in jeopardy. The Honda Indy, Luminato, North by Northeast, the Toronto Jazz Festival, and so many other events attract millions of visitors to Toronto's waterfront each year, but are at risk today. Will the government support the event industry in Ontario, or will it allow iconic events like the CNE to Question. die, like so many other small businesses and local events during this pandemic? And the government has figured. Speaker, obviously, uh, look. This is, as I just said, this is too important a sector uh, for us not to uh, to all uh, pay uh, very close attention uh, to. It's not just the city of Toronto, uh, Mr. Speaker. If I plug for my own hometown, uh, you know, the the Strawberry Festival in in Stouffville has uh, been something that has brought so much economic activity to the downtown of Stouffville. It has been cancelled for the last uh, uh, for the last year and this year coming forward. I I know that uh, in Barrie, the Elvis Fest is something that I loved uh, and enjoyed. And across uh, Across the province, Mr. Speaker, there are small uh, festivals which might not make the headlines like uh, like the CNE, but are so important uh, to uh, uh, to the hospitality industry and to the economies of small towns, uh, villages, and communities across this province. Response. So it's not just the CNE; it is hundreds of thousands of jobs, billions of dollars worth of economic activity, Mr. Speaker, and we are not going to lose that. We are a government that wants this economy to come booming back, and the arts and culture is, and attractions are just are. An important part of that, Mr. Speaker. The next question. Member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, and, uh, we got just before the end of the question period. I would like to ask the Minister of Health about AstraZeneca doses. And there's a lot of controversy right now about those doses sitting in freezers and that they're not going to be used and that some of them will expire. So what I think Ontarians need to know, especially those who've received AstraZeneca, and those who are concerned about wasting those vaccines, which we all agree would be the wrong thing to do. So can the minister let us know, is there a plan, will it be some information coming to us to let us know what's going to happen with those AstraZeneca doses that are in freezers right now? Minister of Health. Thank you very much for the question. This is an important issue, I know, to many people who've received the first dose of AstraZeneca. I'm one of those as well. However, we are waiting to hear from Dr. Williams uh, on the effectiveness and, the, and any concerns that there are still out, outstanding with respect to AstraZeneca. We do have some. We don't intend to waste any of those doses. But what will happen for people with AstraZeneca, either they will receive the second dose of AstraZeneca, and there are indications coming from the UK that the VITTs, the problems with that on the second dose are much less than with the first dose, and that in the event we don't proceed with those AstraZeneca doses, also from the UK, there is evidence that it can be combined with an MNRA uh, dose, either Pfizer or Moderna. But we expect that we will have that information from Dr. Williams and the medical team well in advance of any expiry date for those doses, so nothing will be wasted. So thank you for the question. Point of order, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks so very much, Speaker. I would like an opportunity to correct my record. I misspoke earlier regarding the loss of life in the third wave. As of today, we've lost 1,911 uh, lives to, uh, to the third wave, and we're tragically close to the grim milestone of, of 2,000 lives lost in the third wave. Point of order, the Government House Leader. Uh, uh, yes, Speaker, just to, to correct my record, actually, Elvis Fest. Uh, is in uh, Collingwood and uh, not uh, in Barrie. There's lots of great things that happen in Barrie, but Elvis Fest is actually in Collingwood. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.